I want to talk to you about my grandmother. Vera, 70-something, walks every day with Mozart on her discman and swipes at an iPad misguidedly bought for her to little or no effect. She, alongside my grandfather, refers to social networks and internet concepts in strange plurals and portmanteaus, the Facebooks, the tweet space. This talk is for her. It's for her and all the other Veras out there, older Austrian women and not, who might catch glimpses of the data retention headlines and move on, deciding that reading about Abbott versus Putin is more exciting than battling with terms, concepts, and ideologies that they can't or don't want to understand. I'm going to break it down for you in answer to five questions my grandmother asked me a few weeks ago when I told her I was presenting here today around data retention. One, what is it? Two, why would they want my information? Three, what can they do with my phone bill anyway? Four, if I have nothing to hide, why should it matter? And finally, as with all good grandmothers who believe their grandchildren to have the answers to everything in this brave new world, five, what's your answer? In 20 minutes, you will be informed, opinionated, and riled up about data retention if you aren't already, or I will have failed my grandmother, and none of us want that. Let's start with the basics. What is it? Defining metadata. All those headlines that Vera skipped over about data retention, they're about the long time government on again, off again proposal to retain our metadata for up to two years for crime fighting purposes. Metadata, not unlike YOLO, amazeballs, and twerk, is a term almost designed to confuse older generations. So good has this design effort been that, we don't, that we've ended up with a term which is basically devoid of meaning for everyone, from the Veras of this world to the highest offices of government. The typical definition is a cop-out in itself, less of a definition than a distinction, one drawn between a couple of old school items even my grandma would understand, a letter and an envelope. As far as telecommunications are concerned, phone calls, web browsing, emails, texts and the like, there is the letter, the content of this communication itself, and the envelope, the information helping that content happen and describing it, phone numbers, call durations, times and locations, etc. The analogy is pretty clean. The old envelope is a trusty device and the traditional distinction is easy to understand. Right? Wrong. The traditional distinction is bankrupt. We'll come back to that bankruptcy a bit later. But what's important to know now is that without it, everyone is struggling to get a grip on how we can define metadata. I asked what I thought was a seemingly, def uh, seemingly simple definitional question to the Attorney General's Department, to the Australian Crime Commission and to the Australian Federal Police as part of a research project I undertook earlier this year. The response was strange. The AFP started looking at my LinkedIn profile. The Attorney General's Department sent me a very terse letter declining to comment because the matter was the subject of an inquiry at the time. The Crime Commission asked me how I got their email address. First name, dot surname at Crime Commission is usually a pretty good giveaway. It didn't make sense to me. All I'd done was ask a pretty basic question. And then Attorney General George Brandis, the man with the CIA cufflinks, got on Sky News Live and cleared it all up with obfuscation as only politicians can. You might have caught the headlines. Brandis fumbles metadata in train wreck interview and the like. Perhaps afraid to put their foot in their mouth, all these agencies put their foot down instead and told me where to go. By late August, a consultation paper had been published, albeit confidentially and only, and only for a select few industry participants, and went some way to defining what the government thought metadata was. In sum, it included information necessary to identify the source, destination, date, time, duration, and type of device used to make a communication. Since Brandis, recovering, has promised that there will be a statutory specification of metadata in forthcoming legislation. So what is it? Basically, metadata is one big watch this space. Now, once we vaguely understand what metadata is, not only are we on par with George Brandis, but we can come to grapple with Vera's next question. Why would they want it? My grandmother has often repeated the saying, may you live in interesting times. Interesting times are good for everyone, it seems, everyone but law enforcement. Interesting times for law enforcement mean terror raids, mass demonstrations, diplomatic tension and the like. Law enforcement is determined to live in uninteresting times. 
To achieve this, so their argument goes, they need metadata retained for up to two years. With interesting times have come impossibly difficult circumstances for law enforcement agencies to operate in. To start with, you have to recognise that the two key acts that determine privacy rights in the telecommunications space are significantly out of date. The Telecommunications Interception Act and Telecommunications Act are over 30 and 15 years old respectively and are based on the technologies of a time when Vera and her mates knew what was up. That is, these are old laws. Accordingly, a number of relevant agencies including ASIO, the AFP and the Australian Crime Commission have pointed to a changed technological landscape and a legal regime that is hugely out of touch as a reason to institute data retention in Australia. There are diagrams I could show you about how different life was in 1979, which might involve Malcolm Fraser, Sony Walkmans and the Iranian hostage crisis, but I won't. Suffice to say that the year the Telecommunications Interception Act was introduced, hairstyles and the state of technology alike looked radically different. So there's a first reason law enforcement want mandatory data retention, technological challenges and old school laws, and I'll give them that. These sorts of operational arguments are completely legitimate. Investigating criminal activity currently within the bounds of the existing legislation would be akin to watching Game of Thrones on dial-up. It's a nightmare. A second reason law enforcement puts forward for why they need these vast tracts of metadata is because it is this kind of data which is useful to identify and obtain basic background information about persons of interest. When you can find out who a suspect is calling, when they're calling from and who they're sending their emails to, actually nabbing the perp becomes a far likelier prospect. Law enforcement argues that this metadata, not privacy intrusive in the least, is essential for highlighting the networks of suspects. If you think about a detective from Law and Order SVU piecing together mug shots of criminals on a big whiteboard, the metadata would be the stuff helping them draw the lines between the photos. This too seems inherently fair. Building a profile of a suspect from a communications network is what law enforcement should be able to do, after all. Finally, on the need to maintain this information for two years, ASIO has answered the call to suggest that things take time. Sleeper cells might go on sleeping for 23 months only to rear their ugly head at an opportune time and so being able to go back through the records to work out just who was talking to who and when is another seemingly legitimate reason to retain metadata for two years. Now fundamentally and perhaps despite the cop bashing that often goes along with any discussion of data retention, law enforcement arguments add up. There are very real reasons they need some of this data. With so many good reasons to retain metadata, <clears throat> and especially if it's just envelope material, ephemera and numbers that accompany the actual meat of our conversations, why should we care? In Vera's words, what can they do with my phone bill? This is where that bankrupt distinction I mentioned earlier comes back to bite. If metadata really was just innocuous numbers, dots and dashes and typical nerd fare, pure envelope, <clears throat> excuse me, and giving, up, and giving it up could foil major terrorist threats, I'd been sending mine over to Brandis and Co this evening express post. But the truth of the matter is somewhat different. The truth is that envelope and letter no longer stand apart. Envelope, metadata, can be just as revealing as letter, content, sometimes more. The collapse of this binary has been borne out across a number of studies, some more academic than others, which suggest that metadata is often a proxy for content. I particularly, sorry, I particularly like a Stanford study released in March this year called Metaphone which looked at just the phone records of 500 or so participants. The results were freaky. Metadata alone could be used to identify medical conditions, financial and legal connections and even whether phone users owned, owned a gun. If you were participant A in that study and in a span of three weeks called a home improvement store, locksmiths, a hydroponics dealer and a head shop, it would be not unreasonable to assume you might be looking to take advantage of California's relaxed cannabis laws. More specific examples abound, including that of a German politician that Scott alluded to earlier, who plotted six months of his phone metadata on Google Maps to startling effect. There are a number of spooky illustrations like this out there, but behind the social maps and drug dealers lies a more fundamental takeaway. Metadata is deeply personal. 
In the US, where law enforcement is still reeling after the bad press around their surveillance program, a couple of bigwigs have made some very telling comments. Former NSA general counsel Stuart Baker has said, if you have enough metadata, you don't really need content. And the agency's former director general, Michael Hayden, recently asserted in a bit of a horrific faux pas, we kill people based on metadata. Suddenly that image of innocuous, non-intrusive numbers and dashes begins to fracture. To be sure, despite how much my grandma might be interested in my life, nobody at ASIO or the AFP wants to sort through my metadata to put together a fancy map of just where I've been and who I've talked to. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. They don't want to do it for me or you or probably anyone that, uh, that I or you know. Bulk collection is not tantamount to mass surveillance, but the potential for mass surveillance is real. Moreover, you should care, Vera, because the question is not necessarily what can they do with my phone bill, but what can others do with my phone bill? While the nuts and bolts of any data retention regime are still to be worked through, the security threats posed by unauthorized access to this data are undeniable. The Australian Inspector General of Intelligence and Security told the Law Society of New South Wales in May that the Australian proposal on data retention is different to the US experience in that, in Australia, telcos rather than law enforcement would be responsible for storing metadata. That is not a comforting thought. If the responsibility for storing and securing data is left solely to telcos, the very nature of this obligation would tend to undermine data security. While law enforcement stands to gain from access to metadata, guaranteeing its security would represent a cost center for telcos. It would be a part of the business that did not produce profit but added to their cost of business. The incentive to secure is just not there. If I went to the bank, asked them to store my priceless jewels in a safety deposit box, and then told them that they would have to pay for the privilege, do you think my jewels would be there tomorrow? It's the combination of the sincerely personal nature of metadata and the security challenges its storage represents that suggests why we should care about mandatory data retention. What can they, what can they do with my phone bill? The answer, Grandma, is potentially more than you would ever be comfortable with. But what if, as the theme of today's workshop contemplates, we really are post-privacy? What if all of us, and us young folk are often the shining exemplars, are over privacy? We don't care if someone can follow our Instagram trail to the hashtag cafe we're sitting at. We don't care about the implications of Snapchatting each other naked. We don't care if someone, somewhere in the deep, dark recesses of Canberra knows who we tend to email. If, as my grandmother puts it, I have nothing to hide, why should it matter? Even if we are post-privacy, and I don't necessarily accept that we are, there seem to be a number of factors militating against the introduction of a mandatory data retention system, and they come down to three Cs. Costs, criminals, and complaints. Firstly, criminals. There were a staggering 320,000 or so authorizations, not warrants, doled out to law enforcement last year to selectively access metadata. The Attorney General's Department issues a report into the Telecommunications Interception Act each year in which it details the effectiveness of warrants granted over the past 12 months in terms of how information gleaned under these warrants has contributed to arrests, proceedings and convictions. It's beautifully transparent and wonderfully accountable and it does not apply to metadata authorizations. Perhaps the most compelling argument that can be made against data retention proposals is the simplest one. Law, enfo law enforcement can't, or at least hasn't to date, proved that this data is actually helpful in tracking down criminals. The lofty notions I referred to earlier in favor of data retention are great as hypotheses, but they kind of fall over when not supported by evidence. If anything, the evidence flows the other way. Just before its constitutional court threw out its data retention program, a 2009 German study found that a retention regime could raise the crime clearance rate in the country by 0.002% at best. That is a lot of zeros after a decimal place. Importing numbers is not necessarily a smart way to argue, but recognizing the evasion techniques of criminals might be. With a raft of tricks and hacks up their sleeves, criminals will inevitably adopt techniques with strange names like steganography and Tor anonymizers, as well as the kind of stuff your every man might resort to to evade metadata retention. 
burn phones, identity theft, etc. What we end up with then is a dragnet data retention program that snags little bait fish like us and lets the cl clued up criminal whales swim away. Second C, costs. There are a lot of them associated with a two year mandatory data retention program. Costs of collating data, costs of storing data, costs of securing data, costs of making data available to law enforcement, costs of destruction, etc. IINET Chief Regulatory Officer Steve Dolby reckons it'll cost his company $60 million to do it. Others have suggested industry wide implementation could be as high as $700 million. That's a lot of zeros before a decimal place. But who will foot the bill? The EU experience demonstrates that some programs are government funded, some are industry funded and some are jointly funded. The funny slash sad thing about all of the above is that one way or the other that $700 million comes from us. If law, if law enforcement pays for it, we do indirectly through our tax. If industry pays for it, we do directly through what Dolby has estimated as a hike of about $5 per month on all consumer offerings. Can you hear that? That sounds definitely like a lose-lose. Third C, complaints. This is a lesser evil but still one that needs to be contended with. A 2010 report on Australian privacy complaints handling found that the system did not work very well at all. With a complex web of cross referrals to contend with, complaint bodies with fewer resources and more responsibilities and the impending demise of the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, consumers today continue to face uncertain and inconsistent outcomes. Whether they care deeply about it or not, adding a few million unsuspecting Australians to the list of potential telco complainants will strain a complaint system already under pressure. So what have I done then? Like all good Gen Ys, I've deconstructed a problem, attacked the authorities, exposed some fundamental issues and left a god awful mess. Time to pick up the pieces and answer Vera's last question. What's your answer then? The answer is something called data preservation, sort of. Data preservation is different to data retention. It requires telcos to collect metadata only for a specified period on targeted users. If metadata really is helpful in uncovering criminal networks and if someone will pay for it and if someone will ensure its security and those are all big ifs, data preservation will aid law enforcement. But it won't be perfect. There will always be the ones who get away because they're savvy tech heads or because they operate as part of sleeper cells or because they slip under the data preservation radar. The real question is, is our privacy collectively as Australian telco users worth compromising to catch the ones that get away? That's a question for another day, Grandma. Thank you. <laughs>